Welcome to Think Like a Dog podcast, where we explore dog behavior and psychology-based training to help your dog achieve their full potential. All right, welcome back to Think Like a Dog podcast. And today we're getting back into the swing of things. We haven't done this in a while, in right? months. Yeah. Months. It, uh, we normally kind of pre-record a lot of episodes because between my schedule and Andrea's schedule, it is difficult to find time. Um, so this is the first episode that we've recorded in a while. And we've got uh, a lot of updates, a lot of big things That's that have true. happened in the last uh, <laughs> few months. Yeah. So starting off, I mean, we talked about a lot about Sue and how we are best chance fosters and good news. They both got adopted and they found amazing homes. I mean, I can't think of a more perfect match for each one of them. Howie's family has followed through with training, has been going to um, the the classes with yeah, Mirror Image Canine. At yeah. almost every event that we have, which is awesome. I actually, he is boarding with me um, at my house, I think, starting Thursday so or tomorrow. So I'll see him tomorrow, which That's is amazing. really exciting. I love that. And then Sue, I met her family, and we got to talk about Sue, and Sue is thriving. I mean, she has a brother now who is a poodle mix. His name is Teddy, and they just have the most fun. And Perfect. then on other news, we both changed our last names. Yeah, we, we just decided. We didn't, and I mean, no that, no big deal. Yeah. We just went in and we're like, let's <laughs> change our last No, we both got married. Um, it was I have year. a really weird way of saying we... I'm married. married. <laughs> I know. I went in to change my last name that morning and I uh, look at Sarah. And I was like, what should I, what should I change it to? <laughs> I could just pick anything at this point. Well, there's endless options. No, You know, but we, when I got married, Ozzy and I did it in a, you know, more quiet way. And it was so awkward for me to tell people that we were married. I um, mean, no, it wasn't because I, you opened the door and both you and Ozzy were staring at me, creepily smiling at me. <laughs> and I mean, I walked in and I mean, you gave me a gift and then yes. you said, we got married. We just had a <laughs> lot of emotions going on that day, but we announced it. We're good. We updated our name on the podcast. If you guys haven't noticed that yet. Um, so our names are updated, you know, we're married, things are good. Know. Big, big updates. Sue and Howie are officially adopted and Rusty has made huge progress. I mean, Rusty is a completely different dog. All we need right now for Rusty is a good home. So if you're in Georgia, if you're interested in adopting a dog, look at Rusty, read a little bit more about him. We have his entire story on our IG. Mm -hmm. Um, where we show from his first day that we we rescued him to now. And we also have an application on AussieAlbiesFoundation.org where you can apply to adopt um, Rusty. So today we're going to talk all about crates. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of questions that came in about crates, which way is the best way to do it. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of different things that we're going to discuss today, but we are going to start off by talking about the importance of crating your dog and, you know, what it means to crate your dog. We're actually going to start off, um, hopefully not with you getting in trouble, but, um, I just finished just in preparation of, of recording today, I just finished, um, the question and answer part one, um, episode and we talked a lot about how your mom had to had to crate train Poochie and Louie, right? Um, I have a question for you. Are they sleeping in the crate overnight? Um, the answer is no. Get out. <laughs> I knew I knew it. On my way here, I'm but, like, they're not doing this anymore. To balance off the scale that we talked about before. I do put them in there to take naps during the day. For and, you to take naps? Oh, okay. <laughs> for them. And when I leave the house, they're in there. And they are not crying hysterically anymore when I leave. Okay. So they do quiet down when I put them in the crate. So we're okay. taking baby steps. For you guys that don't know, Louie and Poochie are my little babies. They're tiny Her dogs. little dogs. <laughs> I have a total of seven dogs that I am responsible for right now. But for some reason, I cannot follow through with the crate chain training of my little dogs. So if you're listening to this and you have a little dog and you're struggling, I am with you. Okay. I am there with you. But just put them in the crate. <laughs> I mean, okay. So Rusty is a good segue. The reason yeah. that Rusty is 
in the program and, and that you pulled him was because of, um, well, he was in a kennel with what, five or six other dogs. Right. Oh. And a, a fight broke out obviously. Cause what is, I mean, it's bound to happen if you put five or six dogs in a, in a giant kennel together. Um, but they tried to separate him and put him in a crate and he had such anxiety in the crate that he was tearing up his face. It was rough. That video was rough. When I first saw him, it was rough. Mm -hmm. Um, but because Andrea was consistent with him and created him every single night and created him uh, throughout the day and, and made sure that there was a routine around that. Rusty is much better in the crate. That is true. He has improved tremendously <laughs> and his anxiety went down a lot. Oh yeah. He he's actually out with other dogs. Now there is less anxiety around other dogs mm -hmm. and when we rescued him, the reason why they were pleading for help is because of his anxiety in the crate. So he was so anxious in the crate, like Millie said, he was hurting himself and he was hysterical. I mean, he would not stop barking in the shelter. It was really hard on him. So they were pleading for someone to take him in. And all we had to offer him was a crate and a room full of dogs. Mm -hmm. So, and that's exactly what they were saying his you know, anxiety was about and dogs that's exactly and what he needed. Yeah. And, um, the first day he came in from the shelter, we put him in the crate right away. And, um, you know, after that, we've just continued that cycle of crating throughout the day, crate rotating since he still had a lot of anxiety around our dogs and sleeping in the crate at night. And now he, goes to the crate mm -hmm. when he feels anxious, you know, so he completely changed that a dog that needed to be rescued yeah. because of his anxiety around the crate now goes to the crate because he feels anxious. Yeah. I mean, we can talk about crate training, um, from a way of a dog like Rusty who has an insane amount or had an insane amount of crate anxiety and how we might go about changing the association of the crate. Um, when, when that's our starting point. And we can also talk about it for, um, from the aspect of you bring a new puppy home. That's another update. I have a new puppy. True. That. Yeah. He's cutest little, little guy. And Andrea's already <laughs> let him chew on her finger. Um, like almost put it in his mouth for him. That, I, I was the one that did that. I mean, big <laughs> puppy teeth when they're teething. I don't know about you guys, but it's the cutest thing when they it like, hurts. <laughs> But it's just little pinches of love. It's like little it's needles <laughs> into your skin. That's how I bond with them, okay? okay. <laughs> There's a reason that Brick is at home and not recording the podcast <laughs> with Andrea today. Um, but, I mean, we can talk about this from both sides. Yeah. So I think first it's important to talk about the... Um, point of the crate and why it's so important. I get a lot of people that, you know, if I ask, are they crate trained, you know, for whatever behavioral issue you're coming to me for, I will absolutely ask you, is your dog crate trained? And most people will answer yes, but we don't use it anymore because it, you know, they don't chew up my house or we're potty trained or they're fine when I'm gone, whatever it is. I do not look at the crate as something that is only there to prevent an inconvenience for me or only there th through a certain stage of my dog's life. It is there as a bedroom for my dog. I do not invite anybody over to stay the night at my house and not offer them a place to sleep. I don't, uh, you know, move in with anybody if I'm not offered a bedroom, right? That is my dog's bedroom. I'm bringing an animal into my home. I need to provide them a space that is theirs. That is the, um, that's what the crate can do for your dog. Now, when it comes to the purpose of the crate for your relationship, the point of that is that's your most kind of like foundational boundary, right? If you cannot get your dog to relax, given that physical boundary of the crate, we're going to have a really hard time getting them to relax in, um, a more psychological boundary like place, which the next three episodes, including this one are going to be talking about like your big three coping mechanisms. I know we've talked about that a lot in previous episodes. Um, uh, what we say over and over again is we want our dog to feel like, you know, they can turn their brains off and they can relax and they can be neutral in, in the crate, in place and by our side. By our side is inevitably the hardest one that kind of is, is the walk that's bringing your dog out into the world that's making sure your relationship with them is uh, a healthy and balanced one. But the crate is always the first one. 
always, always, always. That's kind of the foundation that we can build on. Mm-hmm. And now with crating, you talk about that being a place to turn off for the dog to really be neutral. When you are introducing the crate, are there things that you do to enforce that mindset of turning off? Um, a lot of people talk about giving treats while they go in, pot of positive reinforcement so they can think about the crate as a positive place. Now, would you, I know that your mm-hmm. training method, you believe this is a neutral place. Mm-hmm. Many people would argue positive reinforcement for the crate to help them feel better about going in there. What do you say, have to say about that? I've been using this um, metaphor a lot. So I feel like a lot of people will try to turn something that should be a very neutral, normal ask, right? Like go in the crate and relax because instinctually you are a den animal. This is not something that is unfamiliar to you or, um, you know, a normal ask would be, don't sit on my lap or don't be in my space all the time. Just something that's really not that big of a deal. Um, and we try to make it positive. And I've been telling people to me, that's like a bad car salesman, right? It's like you go to the lot and you're like, okay, you know, this guy is saying, okay, the car is, um, super cheap. It has low mileage. There's nothing wrong with this car. I promise you it's the best car you could ever get. You're going to be looking at that guy like this is too good to be true. Right. I am a big fan of treating it like it is, which is normal, right? I mean, this is a neutral space. So yes, with puppies, like with brick, I definitely did some, um, like some crate drills where I'd say the word crate leash pressure into the crate and then he'd get his food, but it wasn't like he got this extra big treat to go into his crate. It was, that's how I fed him the first couple nights. Like that's how he got his dinner. Um, but I don't, I don't want the crate to represent this, um, any, really any amount of excitement. I want the crate to be a neutral place where they can turn off. So then, so then I can use it for a place that we've talked about this before too. I can eventually use it for processing. I can eventually use it to teach a dog how to observe safely, whether that is they have an intent to bite another dog or the person that walks in their home. I want the crate to eventually mean that it's, I mean, to the dog, such a neutral Uh, environment and safe environment that no matter what happens outside of that crate, they understand it has nothing to do with them so that they can observe and take a second to think about everything. Yeah. And I think with dogs and crates, there is going to be barking. There's going to be, you know, a dog that's upset about going in the crate at first, but that's just something that you're going to have to tough it out, you know? In some cases. If anybody (laughs) wants to go listen to part one of uh, the question and answer podcast, uh, I think that that would be a really good thing to listen to. But you know what? To be fair, to be totally fair, it it will. I mean, I say this, you, in my case, and I have, you know, these backs and (laughs) forths. You're totally backpedaling. No, I, I, I'm, I mean, we're dog parents, you know, listening to this podcast where we all have our, our weaknesses with our dogs, you know, and they wouldn't be listening to this podcast if they didn't. No, I mean, you and I both talk about how, like, you know, I talk all the time about all the mistakes. That's why I listen to this podcast when the new episodes It's just funny because on the way here, I'm listening to you saying he cried for an hour. And so then I let him out. And then now you're saying you just have to tough it out. (laughs) But I, you know, I'm in a, in a position where I, we do, we run a dog rescue, you Mm -hmm. know, so we have, we typically rescue large breeds and they typically come with a lot of baggage Mm -hmm. and, you know, in one part, I am really good about that. I'm really good about structure. I'm really good about following through with what I'm asking about them. Um, all of my big dogs are crate trained. Yeah, if they the dog is over 15 pounds, you're really good at it. You really <laughs> and, are honestly then, better than I am about it. And then on the other side, I have my little dogs and they are like my weakness. But and I feel like they, you know, I feel like I want them to be around me. I want right. them to be next to me, you know. And then when I when you know, when I'm thinking about that too, and I see Louie, which is our newest, you know, youngest dog, he does show that anxiety Mm -hmm. now, you know, like we do, I do have to work through things with Mm -hmm. him and it would be easier. My life would be easier if I just like let him get used to the crate. Mm -hmm. Which you are in your own way right now already. Yeah. And it would be way easier if I could just put them both in the crate, close the door, walk away, get them out the next day. And then in our case is 
you know, it sounds, it's, it of course is an excuse, but we, we go to bed and then of course I have Ozzy and he doesn't like his, you know, any interruptions before he goes to sleep. So mm-hmm. I've never really had time to be away from Ozzy, get them crate trained. And then by the time he comes back, it's like, they're already in the right. crate training routine. Right. Um, so now in my case, you know, we are together, the dogs start crying, Ozzy's like, get them out the crate. I can't listen to this crying. You I know? know it's Ozzy's fault. So, I'm just and we'll we'll talk about <laughs> we'll talk about that too. It's like balance, you know, like mm-hmm. you at least balance enough where if you have a partner and they're not following through mm-hmm. the things you're trying to teach your dog, find like a middle ground at least so your dogs don't fall into that severe anxiety, can't be away from you. At least try to implement some kind of normality in their life. Absolutely. You know? So what we've gotten to the point is, you know, by the time he wakes up to the time they go to sleep, they're introduced to the crate throughout the periods of the day. And they've done better with that. Mm-hmm. You know, like Louie will go in and out his crate sometimes. Poochie would find the crate and go lay in it. So Good. they're associating it with a calm place to be. Perfect. Um, but would it be better if they could just sleep in the crate at night? Would it help them more? Yes. You know, and the reason that, that it would, and the reason I, I am so, um, I, it's not about, uh, them not sleeping in bed, right? That's part of it. But I think the reason I'm such a big stickler for the dogs sleeping in the crate overnight is because most of the time that people come to me and their dogs are not crate trained or, um, you know, they, they don't have this practice of being neutral, that practicing that mindset, that dog, um, is not getting a good night's rest because that dog is up at every moment of, you know, they, they hear a sound, they hear this, they hear that because they feel like they, they have to be, there's something in the, in the relationship that's making them feel like they have to be the decisive one. Right. So allowing them to ra- relax and, and rest in their crate even though the first couple weeks that you were on that routine with them, it might not actually be relaxing. Right. But allowing them that chance of, of learning how to turn off, um, overnight is actually going to help your dog behave better the next day. They're going to get a a good night's rest. I, I firmly believe that, um, well, let's talk about this. There is a difference between a dog that has, um, separation anxiety and containment phobia, right? I have probably only one time in my career seen a dog with true containment phobia. And that's a dog who actually does not need to, um, it's not about the relationship with human. It's not that the dog wants out of the crate because, um, because they need to be next to the human. It's that the dog wants out of the crate because they want out of the crate. Right. So containment phobia is once again, you just practice, um, over time and, and making sure that that's a, a more normal routine for them. But most of the time that I see a dog who struggles in the crate, it is very rarely about the crate. It's about what the expectation the dog has of what, what, what are they going to do outside of the crate? So, you know, the dog who is screaming in the crate, they're not necessarily screaming because they're in the crate. They're screaming because they're not right next to you. They're screaming because they can't follow you around the house. They're screaming because they can't jump on the sofa or eat the food off the table or whatever they, you know, their own expectation is of what they get to do when they're out of Mm -hmm. the crate. So I think one of the bigger problems that I have is that people who only crate when, um, you know, overnight even, right, when there's really nothing going on, we never teach the, like, that's still such a big contrast of you're either out doing whatever you want or you're in the crate and and can't make any decisions. There needs to be a middle ground of you're out of the crate and still not making a lot of decisions because mm-hmm. then you're inevitably setting the dog up to uh, be frustrated in the crate because the alternative is doing whatever they want. And like I said, you know, you, on my side, because I have my bigger dogs that I have crate trained, I have put them in the crate mm-hmm. consistently throughout the day. They take naps in there, they, they sleep at night those dogs are easier for me to handle and they're easier for me to have a routine with. Um, you know, it's easier for me to have something going on right now. We have a podcast, they're in the crate. You don't hear extreme barking. Nobody is Mm -hmm. going crazy. Now my little dogs, because I haven't been through that process with them of associating sleep time with crate time. I do pay for that, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's where if I'm recording, we have to get them out the house or else they're going to keep barking Mm -hmm. all the time. Or if, you know, at night 
there is those interruptions where they jump out of the bed, they go to the bathroom. They don't associate that with time to go to bed. Right. And it's one of the basic things that you ask from your clients is when you start your training, whatever it may be, I want you to crate train. I want you to place train mm -hmm. as well. And that's one of the things you have asked from us. And I know that you are always on top of your clients about this because many people think they're going to day camp. They're going to be learning all day. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're going to learn crate training at day camp. But when they get home, they get access to everything. Mm -hmm. So that, that confuses the dog more than anything. Oh yeah. I mean, it's like I said at the very beginning, it is your most basic boundary, right? If I cannot put my dog in a crate, walk away and, you know, clean my house or go take a shower, how in the world can I tell my dog to not eat the thing off the counter, right? Because if, if my dog is throwing a fit because they are behind a physical boundary, what, what does my dog think when there is no physical boundary and it's just my words that I'm trying to say, hey, don't do this or don't do that? I, I'm, I mean, there's no way. That's, I mean, we build everything else on top of that. But it's not just for me, right? It's not... The, the crate training isn't just so I can clean my house or, um, you know, I can leave and not worry about my dogs. It's that I can offer my dog a place to go where nobody messes with them. And that's really the key. I can offer my dog a place to go and, and take in and learn the things that, um, and, and kind of process the information that maybe I just taught them in a training session or whatever it is. For Kemper right now, it's a place where you can go and the puppy doesn't mess with you, right? Mm -hmm. It's a place where you can go and the robot vacuum doesn't mess with <laughs> you. It's it's a safe space. It's not just for me. It's I, I really stress crate training not because I want to just be this bossy owner. Um, I want the dog to be comfortable comfortable being given a boundary and and being respectful of that boundary. But I also want the dog practicing a mindset that allows them to be neutral, maybe not in a neutral environment. So at day camp, yeah, we ask these dogs to be neutral in their crates and their crates are in the same room as all of the other dogs. So, um, every, all three of my trainers do this differently, but Jillian likes to do, um, like, let's say we have 20 dogs that day. She'll rotate 10 in, 10 out an hour in an hour out. And she'll kind of pick um, based on our like color levels, we have green, yellow, and red dogs. Um, not actual, that's not the color of their fur. Easton, <laughs> that is for you. Um, Easton and the one episode thought that cinnamon was actually a yellow dog. Um, but <laughs> if you know, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it, you know, she'll have 10 in 10 out just so she can kind of make sure that everybody's getting the exact, um, information and attention that they need. But the 10 dogs that are in their crate, are watching 10 dogs out of their crate playing and, you know, or learning or reacting, you know, the first time that we brought Rusty in there, Rusty was having really big reactions, you know, or even the 10 dogs in the crate, the one right next to them might be freaking out in the crate. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, we will tell people if your dog is not crate trained, they cannot come to day camp. It's just not fair to them because how in the world am I going to have your dog spend half of their time with me, not being able to process the other half of their time with me? That's not fair. And that is also a place where they go to process. Mm -hmm. And you've touched on that many times with us as we started training with you as well, is after training sessions, put them in the crate. Mm -hmm. You know, just put them in there, even if it's just for a little bit, so they can process all that information. And now dogs, they're, they're going to bark, you know, they're mm -hmm. going to bark. If, there's, it's not going to be many times, depending on your dog's personality and, you know, what they react to that you're going to put them in there and there's going to be tons of things going on and they're not going to bark at least once they're going to bark, but you just have to think about like, all right, this is your crate time. Mm -hmm. This is where you're going to be for now. We're going to let you stay here. Um, now with the, with the crate as well, many people, reach out to the rescue and we get pictures and we get long emails of dogs that are needing to be rehomed because of anxiety. That has to be the number one reason why people want to give up their dogs. Either they're saying the dog has separation anxiety or the dog has aggression. Mm -hmm. It shows aggressions. Mm -hmm. And when I get these pictures, the dogs that have aggression they are on the bed on every single picture. They're on top of a bed. Mm -hmm. 
and they don't know what crate is. Mm -hmm. So when I ask them, are they crate trained? They say, no, they, they don't like being in the crate. Yeah. But now I'm going to give up this dog, take it to the shelter because it has anxiety. Yep. That was created by the owner. Yeah. That was created. And we tell or them. Or at least fueled. Fueled. Yeah. And um, I mean, I say a lot of times even created because you get a dog as a puppy. It doesn't know anything. Mm -hmm. It needs information, but you're constantly giving them the bed. You're not giving them any, any crate time at all. Mm -hmm. They're a big dog. They're growing. And then when the dog growls at a family member walking up to you, that's scary all of, all of the sudden. And now the, the dog is a threat to the family because it thinks it needs to resource guard its owner. Yeah. And all of this could be solved with a crate. Yeah. I you mean, but, I mean, starting there for sure. It's, you know, I think you sort of hit on it of the, the barking is going to happen. It's important that we make sure that the barking does not work, but it is your, and I'll say it again, it's your most basic thing because, okay, so I'll tell you this. We have a management software, a scheduling software called Paul Partner, and people can go online and they can, um, or download the app and book sessions with us uh, and upload a picture of their dog, right? Inevitably, I can tell what what you're coming to me for because I see your golden doodle on the couch with your kid kissing them, right? Or I see a picture of your dog in bed, right? And then you're telling me my dog has separation anxiety. Well, that picture is a good reason why, right? You, when, when is your dog given boundaries, right? Also, it kind of says something to me that that is the picture you chose to upload. That is, that because that probably represents your relationship with your dog of you cuddling in bed with your dog or look, I want my dog to be really cuddly and sweet with me all the time. You know, separation anxiety is something that um, we are going to have an entire episode on, but the crate is key for that. That I will not, I mean, I don't think it's fair to a dog to ask them to work through separation anxiety outside of the crate. I also don't think it's safe. I mean, yeah. the crate equals safety, not just when they're a puppy, but when you adopt, you adopt an adult dog from the shelter and you don't know them. I mean, that's all your sort of basic things that everybody knows. Okay, well, um, I get a new puppy. They need to be crate trained until I can trust them out of the house. Well, I mean, you they need to be crate trained until you have clarity in your relationship of who get, who makes the decisions because they might not chew anything up in your house, but if they are barking at every single person that walks by in the window all day long, that's the mindset they're practicing. And that's the mindset they're getting really good at. It's becoming default. Yeah. But if your dog is in the crate all day, your dog is practicing neutral all day, you know, ideally, right? Or your dog is barking it out and realizing that that's not working and, and learning how to take a boundary depending on what level you're at in your crate training. But that is, I mean, it's always the first place to start always. I mean, I won't, there's not a lot I can build on unless we are comfortable in the crate. That is also, I, I make a, um, or after all of my email or off all of my uh, sessions, I'll send out a summary email and it includes, um, a checklist of when I allow dogs on furniture, what do I want my, these dogs to be able to do? What do I want my relationship to look like before I start allowing them on furniture? One of them is they need to be able to rest comfortably in the crate regardless of what's going on around them, right? I mean, Kemper still struggles in the crate specifically uh, from four to six at day camp when he sees everybody else leaving. Yeah. But that's because inevitably at six o'clock, I have to go home. So I have to let him out. And it's a routine that I've just been practicing every single day. But I mean, everyone on my team is trying to figure out a way to work on this. Every Everyone. <laughs> um, and it's something that because of that, Kemper is not allowed on the couch right now because I have to make sure that that is a problem that gets solved. It's, it's, I mean, it's a, there's no wiggle room on that for me. You know, going back to even me being on two sides of the story with a crate, bigger dogs, I'm so passionate about following through specifically with crate training and our foundation. If we have a dog that is really struggling and the owner is willing to work through these struggles. A lot of times we, we've we donated Impact Dog Crates to them to help them give them that first mm -hmm. step into crate training. And Impact Dog Crates, we I talked about it all at the time, they're the best crates made, yeah. you know, because you put a dog in there, no more worries. They won't break out. They won't hurt themselves. They're going to cry it out. They're going to try to come out, but they can't. They're not going to hurt themselves. And that's why even I took Rusty in with that severe anxiety that he had. I knew I had the right crate. Mm -hmm. 
I couldn't take him if I had a, just a regular wired crate and stick him in a room with five other dogs yeah. and expect them to, for me to come back and for him not to be hurt or breaking out of that crate. And yeah. God knows what happens after that. But the impact dog crates had, you know, you, it's one of the best crates out there and bigger dogs don't have a lot of room for mistake. You get a big dog, you get a pit bull mix, you get whatever, a big dog that has power, that dog becomes anxious, that dog becomes aggressive, they're going to look scary. They're going to do some damage if they try to defend themselves or feel like they're, you know, yeah. they're trying to protect their territory. That's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, in, in our case, our big dogs, we have pit bull mixes. If, if I had all these dogs in my house right now, and all of them had access to our couch and bed. Oh my God, don't even. My <laughs> heart just like sunk into my it, stomach. They wouldn't even be here right now because no, on the first few days, they would have all gotten a terrible fight yeah, and would somebody would have yeah. gotten severely yeah. hurt. Yeah. So I, I can't. But so when I tell people I have seven dogs is because they are all, all of my big dogs, all my pit bull mixes, they're, they're, they, they don't have to be around my little right. dogs. They can be in the crate. They can have their time out. They can play. They're fulfilled at the end of the day. And I can make sure that I can give them some basic structure mm -hmm. so where they understand our relationship. Mm -hmm. So now we are at a point with all of our dogs because we started with crate training and because they have been consistently going to the day camp and they have been practicing neutral mindset where my 60 to 80 pound dogs walks next to me beautifully mm -hmm. on the leash. And like I said, they are easier to take care of than my little ones because my little ones, I didn't provide that structure. Yeah. So when you trade off some things with your dog, you're going to have to pay for it a little bit. Like mm -hmm. in my case, I'm trading off the, I don't want to go, I can't go through the period of a week really crying and letting them cry out in the crate at night. But am I paying for it? Yes, because they do disrupt my sleep. They don't know when it's bedtime. They, they are, although they can chill out in the crate a little bit during the day, it would be awesome if I could just put them in there at night and just let them well, cry it out, you and know? I don't, I mean, I've worked with all of the big dogs. You don't let me touch the little dogs, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but I, I know based on kind of what we've talked about, the little dogs, I feel like from what you've told me, almost have more anxiety than the big dogs. Oh yeah. So they do. it's because we don't have any sort of, we haven't taught them a coping mechanism mm -hmm. of dealing with, um, of stress. Right. But you, you said a, a, a really important point. Crate training can be difficult when your dog has either previously hurt themselves in the crate, um, or broken out of the crate, whatever it is. Impact dog crates are the way to go. We have one impact in, in, um, at the center and there are, it is, I mean, insane, the difference in, a dog who maybe struggles in a wire crate, we put them in the impact. I mean, they are calm. We don't hear from them at all. Like I have to be like, who's in the impact? And they'll sit, they'll, they'll it's you know, crazy. tell me a dog's name. I'll be like, really? I haven't heard anything. Right. Yeah. I mean, if we could have all impact crates, that would be my dream, but that there's too many dogs in my life for that. So, <laughs> um, but it is, it's a, a lot of times, yes, you might get the barking, but if you do an impact because your dog has hurt themselves previously, you have to do an impact but you might not even get the barking with that. That's mm -hmm. truly how amazing those crates are. Oh, yeah. I mean, like I said, with, with Rusty, that was the ultimate test because he is strong. Mm -hmm. He is an extremely strong dog. And his main goal when going inside the crate was how can I break out of yeah. this crate? So he would try to bite it, scratch it. Um, it would be, you know crazy the amount of anxiety he but would he have doesn't in that even crate. try in the impact i mean he he does try he oh, tries he to bite so inside the impact he's tried to like bite oh, it okay. somehow and i mean it you can't get out of the like i can't yeah they won't ever break out so i can just close the door walk out the room i know he's gonna be right there when i come back right and a lot of people say well, it's a big investment. Well, it's worth it, you yeah. know, and a lot well, of and times there's a 10 year warranty and you can pay monthly. But I yeah. mean, with Rusty, the, the motivation of, of coming out of that crate wasn't because he he was nervous about being in the crate. Rusty, I wouldn't even say um, had containment phobia. Rusty, when you got him, 
was on defense mode. Mm -hmm. You said in the last episode um, that I listened to, you know, it was a lot of fear. He was afraid of other dogs. Yes. But Rusty always feels like he needs to be very aware of his surroundings and on defense mode all the time. We have gotten to a point where he lets us make the decisions for him. Right now we're working on the mindset of actually being able to like, it's almost like, um, (laughs) I kind of look at it like you are a mom teaching your 15 year old how to drive, right? You are letting them drive, but you're still very aware of what's going on. You know, you're not in control, right? What we're working on is getting Rusty to take a nap in the passenger seat, really letting us kind of chill, like just take the control and allowing us to just do it for him. Right. But Rusty's motivation, it wasn't about the crate. It was about, I need to be in control of the situation because I'm worried about my own safety. Right now, not everybody. I mean, if you can't, you know, if you can't afford a, an impact crate or let's say um, for some reason it won't fit in your car or your house or whatever it is, right? The crate training, it is one thing. The only way that I change the, my kind of crate training routine is if I believe the dog will hurt themselves. And if I have an owner who says I cannot afford the impact crate or if I have an owner who says and my dog has previously hurt themselves in the crate, then we look at, okay, your dog needs to be sleeping in the crate overnight, ideally outside of your bedroom, right? The way that I do that is I pick a time every single night that is the dog's bedtime, regardless of if I'm going to sleep, if my husband's going to sleep, if whatever, right? This is your bedtime. We even have like an alarm that kind of sounds and says it's Kemper's bedtime because we forget. The dog goes in the crate regardless at that time. And then there is a time in the morning that they do not come out until. Now, when you have a puppy, like with Brick, There might be a time at one o'clock in the morning, I have to go and let him out. But then we come right back inside and he goes back in his crate. It's not, we go outside and then you get to come and cuddle with me for a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that is your first kind of way of, of getting them comfortable in the crate. If you have a dog with extreme containment phobia, I would look at just putting your dog in the crate for 20 minutes while you're watching TV or while they're eating. You know, that's a good one too. It's not necessarily just to make it a positive thing. It's just to associate it with something more routine. I also like feeding them in the crate for resource guarding issues. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Well, feeding t- in we the should crate. have a whole resource guarding episode. Yes. Yeah. And the crate training and adding in feeding time in the crate. I was just thinking about this the other day, how I used to feed. This was the time I had three dogs and back when I met you a year ago <laughs> <laughs> and I used to feed them outside the crate. I thought it was like, that's where they needed to eat. Yeah. You know, there's no way they could, eat. I don't know what I was thinking, but I would put Max's food bowl down cane and they would just go like, it would be chaos. Cause I would walk in, I would put the, the, the place down and then Max would try to eat Kane's food and then Kane would growl at Max. And then I would try to get Max away. And I'm just like, Max day it was and now I have all I go in there mm-hmm. they know it's it's time to eat I put their 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 plates inside their crates close it a couple minutes take them out they all ate and like we talked about before not only does that help you um, associate eat meal time with the crate it, it helps with crate training you're also it helps you give your dog a time frame to eat mm-hmm. and they know they need to eat right right then and there. And if they don't, that also gives you an association with, is something wrong with my yeah. dog? So yeah. it helps you keep track of your dog's health so much better oh, yeah. than just free feeding them all day. And then you never know if your dog's not eating as well, what's yeah. going on. Is there something you need, like, need to look out for? Yeah, so, with Brick, I mean, he's yeah. a puppy, so he has puppy ADD. So he's going to, if I try to feed him outside of the crate, he is, you know, what's that shiny thing over there, right? So... All of his meals are taking place in the crate at this time, or he's working for them in some way, right? He's learning something about a command or me or whatever it is with the food. Um, But most of them are in the crate um, and he's just kind of chilling in there. Now, I think nap time in the middle, in the middle of the day is a big one. I want, I want your dog to be able to just go in the crate for whatever reason. I mean, no reason whatsoever of you can go in here and I can either move throughout my house or I can go and run some errands or I can go upstairs and take a bubble, but whatever it is, you know, it's just, it's your way of practicing this, um, almost like this kind of 
fully encompassing idea of what cr- the crate is. It's not just when I go to sleep. It's not just for mealtimes. It's not just when you leave the house. It's sometimes for no reason at all. And I think a lot of times we forget to do that part. And so then the dog is crate trained up until something different happens in the house. Yeah. And if we really want to utilize the crate as a coping mechanism, that's the part we really also need to add in. And I think I already said it at the very beginning, but the last way that I practice the crate is latent learning, right? So I do some sort of training session with my dog or um, coming home from day camp or group class or whatever. Then my dog goes in the crate after. I mean, I did um, a little kind of training session with Brick and Kemper this morning and Kemper finally corrected Brick for something. I've been waiting for it. And it was a perfect correction. Everything was great. I put Brick immediately in the crate after because I wanted that to sink in. I wanted him to process. It's the same thing that we talked about when we bring home a foster dog, putting them directly in the crate. And uh, we had some questions come in through Instagram. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That um, we can quickly go, go through Um, and one of this ones stuck out to me. It said, is it ever too late to teach your dog to crate regularly? No, it is not ever too late. Uh, this is where I am going to admit some things. So, uh, Pastrami, my black lab who passed away last September, she was 12. I did not have a crate for her. I should have. Um, but I did not get a crate for her up until I got Kemper and I got Kemper probably, I think a year and a half before she passed away. And the reason I got her a crate was because she kept trying to go in Kemper's. She kept trying to like get away from the new puppy, right? That's not going to be everybody's um, uh, kind of situation, but it's never too late. Now, given a certain age and any medical history, I might say we we might take it a little bit slower. So we might just do it for mealtimes at first when you're in the same room, just to make sure we don't really hurt ourselves. But no, I mean, it's never, ever too late to do anything. And all of our dogs that we've adopted, they came to us not as a puppy. So they learned the crate as we learned about the crate too. Well, you also with every single one of those dogs... From the moment they got home, what did they do? Yeah, You put them directly in the crate. That's the yeah. same thing I did with Brick, right? It was their first association for with walking into, into this yard, into this house, right? Of, okay, I come here and I'm immediately given a boundary. Also, I'm immediately given a place to decompress and process. That's basically the overall idea of what we've talked about even today is I'm immediately given a boundary and I'm given a place to relax and turn my brain off. And now um, someone said, my dog starts whining in the crate during storms. Do I leave her in there? She's really sad. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Sad face. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Yes, absolutely. Um, Now, it depends. So, well, yes, you leave her in there. But what I like to do is is something called a contrast of feeling exercise. So if um, it's storming for Kemper, it's fireworks, right? I can use my own dog as an example. When the fireworks start going off, he starts sort of getting anxious, right? I'll put him on place and try to help him out uh, after he started pacing a little bit just to let him feel the stress of that feeling. And then I contrast that with place. Sometimes place isn't enough. And so then if he gets up off of place enough times, I'll put him in his crate so he can really turn his brain off. I kind of look at it like tiers of how much help and support do they need. And for fireworks with Kemper, he needs a lot of support. So if you are putting your dog in the crate before the storm starts, you just want to be careful that you're not associating the crate with storms, right? And, And you're also wanting to make sure that the crate is practiced throughout your day. I mean, in your day-to-day life, not just when it's storming. Um, but I would let your dog feel a little anxious, then put them in the crate. So then that way they can, they can know that there's either this difference between I'm out of the crate and I'm pacing and I don't know what the expectation is of me. And then, Oh my God, thank God mom came and told me what to do. And she told me to just relax in the crate. It's almost like this relief that they get to feel. Yeah. And now this one will also answer a little bit more about the place in the next episode. But this person asked, what is the difference between the place and the crate? Where do you send them? Where and what's when the difference? Yeah, yeah, I get that a lot. Ooh, okay. Um, I sort of said it, right? Like, so if, um, if I see a dog that's really, really anxious and place isn't enough, you know, it, it's not enough of a boundary for them. Um, for them, let's, let's give the idea or the example of the robot vacuum. 
if the dog does not believe that given this psychological boundary of place, even though it's been practiced as something that is a neutral zone and nothing happens to them there, it's still, there's still nothing keeping the vacuum from getting to them there, then I'll send them to crate, right? Another example would be if, uh, well, another kind of um, situation would be if I have a human reactive dog and I'm working towards getting them comfortable with people in my house, I like to put them, and this is something that's kind of debated, but I, I like to have them in the crate, in the same room, like in the living room, and then I tell my guests, pretend like my dog isn't there. So then that way my dog can have like whatever emotion and feeling and outburst that they want to have in the crate, and over time they can understand oh, this person actually has nothing to do with me, right? This is not an unsafe situation. Um, but it also makes, you know, the crate makes it safe in that moment because your, you know, the, your guest isn't getting hurt or bit by your, uh, by your dog. The important part with that, though, the reason that that can kind of be a little bit tricky is that if that is the only time you're only creating your dog when the bug guy comes over to spray your house or when the mechanic comes over, you have guests over, whatever, then the crate will inevitably be associated with um, like a boundary, right? Like with this like jail cell, like frustration of I can't get to the thing that I need to get to because I'm the one in charge of making decisions. You, if you're going to use it like that, you've got to do it the whole way. You have to make sure there's no dog on the furniture. You're making decisions for them all day, every day. No, nobody, you know, they're not in the bed. Um, you are practicing all of this, because if not, you're just using the, the crate as a holding cell, and, and that's not going to ever make it better. And there's a lot of debate between crate is a jail cell, crate mm -hmm. isn't a jail cell, and it's all about your association that you, you give your dog. Like I said, my, my big dogs, they go in the crate. When, when there is a stranger walking into their room, walking around, blowing leaves, whatever it may be, they will start barking they will try to you know give a reaction but then a few minutes in they give they're like all right i'm in the crate it's fine you know and then they forget about that yeah. person um and it happens all the time because we are you know we're constantly having people in in our yard doing stuff and and they will bark it out and now our little dogs because i'm be, like i said because they're not sleeping in the crate it takes them a lot longer mm -hmm. to associate that with all right i can't get to that. I, I should be here and I shouldn't worry about that person out there. And we've had Louie and Poochie in the crate when there's tons of people in our house. Like if, um, the other day, Ozzy was setting up a new aquarium Oh my Lord. and there we had about 10 people that came in to move this gigantic aquarium into our basement. Oh my so my thing is I put Louie and Poochie in the crate in the basement mm -hmm. so they could see what was going on. Mm -hmm. They can at least like see the people. And Louie and Poochie barked for a few minutes, yeah, but then they quiet down. Like I forgot they were in there. Cool. Good. And yeah. when I opened the crate for Louie, because he's a more anxious dog, he went right back in the crate. He said, I don't want to be in this room full yeah. of people. I want to be here. So I can just, I, I can opt out here. Yes. Yeah. So I think given the jail cell thing, and I think it's important to talk about this um, really quick. I know we probably have one more question, but um, okay. I look at it like a bedroom. I got sent to my room when I was younger, but that didn't mean that my, my room was inevitably bad, right? It is a way to... Um, prevent issues. It is a, a way to, uh, for your dog to cope. Uh, but it's about how you look at it, not how the dog looks at it. A lot of people say, Oh, my dog hates the crate. Like I said, it's not about uh, your feeling, your dog's feelings about the crate. It's about your dog's feelings about what they get to do when they're out of the crate. It is so important. Um, people say, well, I've never used it as a punishment, which is good. But it's not about not using it as a punishment. It's about what energy are you doing this with? If, you're do, if you are putting your dog in the crate, let's say because they jumped up and broke a vase, right? And it, there's glass all over the floor. Yeah, you're going to have to put your dog in the crate to clean up the glass. But, and it might seem like a punishment to them because they just did something bad, right? But if you just calmly grab your dog's collar and put them in the crate and you're not yelling, you're not frustrated, you're not doing this out of anger or as a punishment, 
then it's not going to come off like one. So it matters how you believe, right? Like what you believe it is. If you believe it is there for safety, if you believe it's there um, to as a, as a good thing for your dog, as a coping mechanism, then the barking won't matter. Then how you, like what times you put them in there won't matter. It won't ever be an unfair ask because you know it isn't. That's, that's the most important thing about crate training. Now, someone said that they tips to reintroduce the crate. They sleep there at night and sometimes in it during the day. Separate, separation anxiety when we leave. Are so, they? Uh, my first question would be: So you're not using the crate when you leave? So I'm I'm guessing not. You know, since they said sometimes during the day and sleeps there at, at night. So they're saying, how can I reintroduce this and make it positive? Yeah, I mean, I would if your dog is not hurting themselves in the crate, I would put them in the crate when you're gone. Um, the only other sort of uh, time where I've had people and I've backed off, say that um, they couldn't put their dog in the crate when they're gone is if they work like 10, 12 hour shifts and they have a doggy door and the dog has to go outside to go to the bathroom. I get that. But also if the alternative is the dog is freaking out and destroying things and potentially harming themselves, then we get an impact crate and we get a dog walker. That's that, you know, that's our answer there. Um, but for this, it's less about reintroducing the crate and it's more about what's happening in the times where your dog isn't, isn't spending the night overnight in the crate or it's not overnight and it's not the time in the, during the day where your dog is in the crate. Is the dog on the furniture? I mean, separation anxiety is not about the crate. It's about what is happening when you spend that time with your dog. It's not even about when you leave. It's about what your dog, what, what the expectation is of you being with your dog. Does your dog associate you with a responsibility? Does your dog associate you with excitement? Does your, what does your dog associate you with? And so it, to me, it's more, you know, if your dog has separation anxiety, most of the time it's a dog who doesn't have a lot of boundaries. So yes, it's great that you're using it overnight. Yes, it's great that it's being used during the day. I would still, I would, I mean, unless there's a big reason why we, why we aren't, I would put them in the crate when you're gone. But I would also, I mean, I would mainly focus on what happens, what's our relationship look like when, when he's not in the crate. And also, where is the crate, right? Mm -hmm. During, at night, so. Is it in your bedroom? Yeah, that's what we, that something that you mentioned. Yeah, previously. that's another, there's, um, and I keep forgetting about this too. There's two other points. Um, the, if I, I like to get the dogs out of the bedroom the second they're potty trained. So crate out of the bedroom because that's eight hours every night that your dog is practicing spending away from you, which is a huge skill for your dog to learn. Second thing is if your dog is going to the bathroom in the crate or if you're, you know, potty training and you've got, and you have a puppy, it is very rare for dogs to go to the bathroom, uh, in the same place that they sleep, this is the same place that they eat. Um, so I would make sure if you do have a puppy who's doing that, that you are having your dog in there overnight, you are feeding them in there. The other thing that I look at is size. You want to make sure that you are not providing your dog a bedroom and a bathroom all in <laughs> one, right? So make sure it's, you know, smaller, Another thing would be, um, at least with puppies, and this is just a quick little tip, if you have a puppy who is peeing in the crate, take out all the bedding because the bedding soaks up the urine and it makes it just not as big of a deal for them to sleep in it. That has worked for a lot of my clients. Eventually, you can give it back as soon as we get them potty trained. But that's a, it's tough to potty train if, the, if your puppy is also going to the bathroom in the crate. Yeah. So I feel like we discussed a lot today on this episode. On the next episode, we're going to talk about all about place. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, we're going to go through some questions that we've received for, for that episode as well. And do you want to add anything? Lily? Um, before I forget, we have a crate training, like training guide on our website and one on leash walking as well. So it's literally, it'll take you step by step through how to crate train your dog. What does the crate mean? you know, little question and answers, uh, common things that I run into with crate training. So go to our website, uh, mirrorimagek9.com, go to our store. You can download the crate training and the leash walking guide. I'm coming up with a place guide. Just give me a second. guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email us at info at think like a dog dot com. And, if you enjoy our podcast, don't forget to leave us a review. We really appreciate it. It means the world to us. Um, so don't forget. Practice makes progress. All right. Until next time. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at Think Like a Dog Podcast and follow at Mirror Image Canine for training tips. If you have any questions, please reach out to us via email at info at thinklikeadogpodcast.com.